All right, well, let's get started. Welcome everyone to uh, Miller Knowles uh, Design Perspectives. This is our monthly series on all things related to design. And uh, on the August Design Perspectives, we're going to focus on a um, some output of a recent gathering that we hosted in New York City called uh, Leader to Leader. And uh, this was a group of uh, design leaders from across uh, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, uh, who all came together. We felt this was a critical time as it was our uh, first year as Miller Knoll number one, but we're also seeing some significant changes in terms of design culture shift in our industry. And uh, those are largely driven by, uh, I would say, societal, societal shifts and the way people are working. So we gathered this group uh, in New York City uh, several months ago. Uh, we spent time uh, being inspired by this exhibition at uh, the Guggenheim that you see illustrated here on the screen, uh, which was focused on the artist Nick Cave, who happens to be designing a textile collection for Miller Knoll, uh, specifically Knoll Textiles. We did spend time in all of our showrooms. And, uh, but more importantly, um, and above and beyond the design inspiration, uh, the group of leaders that you see represented in these photographs really rolled up their sleeves and talked about some of those uh, shifts that we're seeing in the design industry, which represent not only what they're seeing in their firms, but shifts that are occurring more broadly across uh, the design industry and society as a whole. So we have um, three of those panelists who are going to unpack the conversation from leader to leader with you. And uh, it's going to be a panel conversation moderated by my colleague, Joseph White. Joseph is the Director of Design Strategy uh, with Miller Knoll. And on our panel, we have uh, designers from three corners of North America. Uh, we have uh, Brett Schwery, who is based in uh, Southern California. He is with AECOM, and he is a senior vice president and director of interior design for the Americas and their global business. Uh, we also have uh, Melissa Strickland with HLW in New Jersey, and she is a principal and a workplace sector lead. And then we have Deanna Farmer Gonzalez based in Miami. Deanna is principal of design and strategy with O3 Design. So I'd like to welcome um, Joseph and our panelist to the uh, group. And uh, Joseph, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, and Great, by the thanks. way, before I officially turn it over to Joseph, he is going to moderate um, a conversation with these three leaders, as I mentioned, but we will have time at the end, uh, roughly 10 minutes, where uh, we would like all of you to pose questions to uh, the panel. So simply um, as questions come up, uh, put those questions in chat and uh, and we'll field those questions and give those to the panel uh, at the end. So uh, Joseph and panel, over to you. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, so as we dive in here, I, I want us all to acknowledge that the future is not a foregone conclusion. It's really up to us to build the future that we want. And in many cases, that means championing a change from the status quo. And there are many drivers of change that are impacting our world and our business as design uh, practitioners. But in the interest of biasing towards action and for the purposes of our time together today, we're going to focus on three specific drivers of change and then one more general topic to explore. So these topics also reflect the structure of the written report from the leader to leader event that you will all be able to access after this live discussion. So um, just to give a quick overview of those topics, the first one is participatory design. Um, I would say that this can be most succinctly described as designing with rather than designing for. Um, it's really about soliciting participation from across an organization and keeping those lines of communication mm -hmm. open. In a lot of cases, this requires changes in design schedules, fee structures, team organizations, different ways to engage uh, user base 
take their input to inform the design and um, have that be an ongoing part of practice. The second topic we're framing as quality data. And so the, the key point here is that oftentimes quantitative data alone is not enough to get a complete picture. And we need to focus on more qualitative measures like uh, worker sentiment and engagement level in order to find the real impact for design. And also there are significant implications for design practice with this as well. When we start looking at data as a, as a design input, and even in the case of buildings, the data infrastructure coming alongside mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So this is kind of a, a big shift in the role of design practice, as well as the outcome of design, leveraging data more holistically. The third topic is pilot projects. Um, and straight out of the gate, I will say pilot projects are not mock-ups. Um, this is something very different. These are intentional experiments. They're about testing and learning. Pilot projects really should have a goal in mind that connects to the intended outcomes of an organization, and they have a plan in place to measure the success or not of that project so that those learnings can be implemented to eventually scale towards um, more broadly applied solutions in design. These three really kind of build and link together and start to point towards the fourth topic that we're going to dive in today, into today, which is a broader shift in the culture of design and design practice. Um, also within this topic area is um, notions of the perceptions of value of design. Um, that was something that we talked a lot about in our time together in New York with the leaders to leaders folks. So we've invited and graciously been joined by uh, Melissa and Brett and Deanna, um, uh, members from our 2023 leader to leader cohort, um, not only to share some insight from the event, but also to share some perspective from their specific practice, uh, geographic regions, and thoughts on where we might go collectively as an industry if we were to imagine and realize a different future together. So for our time together today, panelists, I will ask each of you to make an opening statement on a specific topic, and then ask the others to weigh in uh, with your thoughts. And we'll proceed with those three specific topics, and then we'll close with a more open discussion on the broader culture shift we're seeing in design practice. And we'll wrap our time today, as Alan said, with some Q&A from the audience. So those of you that are on the line, please use the chat to enter your questions as we go. Um, all right, so we're gonna kick off with the uh, participatory design topic. And Melissa, I'm going to go to you uh, for your thoughts on this subject. Great. Thanks, Joseph. So uh, as Joseph, Joseph mentioned, uh, participatory design is really a mind shift about we're designing uh, with instead of for. And I think that's important because, you know, yes, we all have uh, creative juices that we're looking forward in to use in our design. But the really what we're doing is to better somebody's life in that space. And we are designing for our clients. Um, so it's a definitely a collaborative process that really starts from the onset. You know, a lot of projects always have obviously a visioning session, but it's so much more than that. It's really, it could be focus groups. It's sort of, um, you know, that really understand the vision and the goals, but it's also about how they work, how they want to work in their new space, how, a, how different departments meet, um, the culture, how they learn, how they socially engage together. And understanding all of that is really important, plus any additional values and missions that they might display as a company. So, you know, this definitely happens a lot during focus groups, but once the upfront part has been done, it's also about how we present back to a client. So it doesn't have to be the formal presentations that used to be like a slideshow, and then you just wait for them to nod and hope that everybody's obviously paying attention. It's about like possibly having workshops, throw the plans on the table, Give your client a pen. Yes, they've all wanted to play architect at some time in their life. I had one client who actually was trying to explain something and what he drew was a pizza pie with chairs all around it. But trying to understand the essence of that, what he was trying to display was that he was looking for something where all the leaders could sit and collaborate and then also sort of potentially turn away to do their private work. And his only way of describing it was a pizza. So obviously we're not gonna design pizza, but you know, you think of when you go make a reservation, it's, you know, everybody wants the round table. So it was understanding that process and that's how it came through for him. Um, so that higher level of engagement all the way through really does better the design 
um, and the outcome, because what ends up becoming is a truly unique design that is tailored to that client, to that team, to uh, that whole agency and department. And therefore, everybody is invested and hopefully the project becomes a successful outcome for them. Um, obviously, we also all want design awards and to be published, but that should be secondary. Um, if it's not successful to our client, then we didn't do our job properly. So that's my take on it. <laughs> or even thinking about the way we structure design awards and the things that we choose to elevate and recognize. Um, I think there's opportunity in that. Um, so Deanna and Brett, I'm wondering if in your practices, um, Melissa mentioned vision sessions, focus groups, workshops. Um, what comes to mind for you on this topic of participatory design and any changes that you've seen within your own practice or client engagements? Uh, I'll I'll jump in. Uh, thanks, Joseph. Uh, a great overview, Melissa. I think the one thing when we think about participatory design is the word participatory, which is who's participating. So who are we getting to participate in here? Is it the typical uh, folks that we ask that provide us quantitative or qualitative information, or are we diving in and being more immersive in the focus groups? Are we actually sitting side by side with um, our clients when they're working uh, versus just doing observational? Are we really understanding that? And then who are we also joining in from um, external uh, influences uh, from the design perspective? Oftentimes, we all know in a project, there's many different uh, uh, folks that make up a project team and they come in and out at certain times. But how often do we bring them in at that very early stage for that depth and understanding um, for them to participate and get what they might feel it would influence the outcomes of the design for the client. Because I think that kind of intel early on is, uh, is something that I would say, well, you know, everybody participated in creating this, even if they had an opportunity to provide the insight. All insights don't have to be used, but certainly provided, I think it makes it a little bit stronger as an outcome for us uh, from design perspective. and. It's it's challenging because we oftentimes don't have all the time to do that, but um, often we all say, but when we do, the outcomes are are great. So I think finding ways to engage more um, at that level uh, is really important. Wonderful, Deanna. Any thoughts from you? You know, um, just to to add to uh, Melissa and Brett's uh, comments. Uh, one of the things is that we do sometimes a, an incredible job up front, you know, with the focus groups and we get the C-suite and we'll also get, you know, the inter intermediaries involved and we do interviews and all of that. But is how do we um, keep that vision and thread throughout and bring those stakeholders in in when other decisions are being made because of budget or because of technical constraints or building constraints um, so that they're seeing that the framework that was put out and the objectives of the project are still going back to that framework of that vision um, and what it was important to the client. So I think, uh, you know, having stakeholder groups that are, um, involved at other phases of the design process um, and, and you know again this is a really about time and so being able to share with our clients the value of that by so many other successful projects that have happened when we have done that I, I think is is really really key and it's about the entire team you know it's a uh, not um, just the design visionary, but also the technical lead, the management lead. Each group has got a stakehold in it, in the in the process. Yeah, for there, sure. Can I just jump in one last thing I wanted to mention about uh, that came out that was really interesting that the leaders discussed, which was communication during this time mm -hmm. because you know we say that word and it seems like it's a very perfunctory thing communicate and make sure everybody knows but do we do it do we do it effectively throughout the process because sometimes we feel like we complete a particular process which also includes certain folks and then they don't need to be you know as involved or communicated so they don't hear what's happening in the background that they can maybe raise a hand and and provide some influence if necessary so i think 
it, I think it's interesting to, to understand to make sure that we're addressing communication styles as we're going through mm -hmm. a design process because we, we get very stuck in, I'll say it again, a perfunctory way of how we communicate. Um, and I think changing that uh, and being aware of it uh, is very helpful in the process because we can have an way and um, it could change something for the better. Um, and so I think it's really important to point out that that was discussed among the leaders that were in uh, our sessions about, about communication. Yeah, Brett, I think what's nice about the additional communication is clients also get worried sometimes about, you know, how do they describe the change to their employees then? Well, if they're part of the process all the way through, that change management and that like shock and awe that can come from going into somewhere new isn't there. They don't have that anxiety. They don't have that angst about it because they've been a part of it and they've been a part of making decisions and at least speaking their voice about it. So I think it ultimately will help the whole uh, end game. Yeah, for sure. You know, one of the, the most compelling thoughts in my mind around this topic is that mm -hmm. if um, you design a space for me and I don't like it, it's on you. But if you design a space with me, then I'm invested in the solution. And if it doesn't work, then I'm going to come back to the table and help you figure it out. And we're going to do it together. And I think that um, a lot of times we've got to acknowledge that these channels of communication don't exist. Um, so I think we have to be really careful um, to not bite off more than we can chew um, in these types of engagements with folks and try to find ways to um, parcel out um, this type of design that allows us to have success stories, to your point, Deanna, that we can point back to and say, hey, this works. You get better results when you do it like this. So it's really about laying a, a new foundation for a road forward. Um, with that, I think I'm going to shift to the second topic um, to keep us moving along, and that was looking at data in practice. Quality data was the term that we we put on top of that, and that was we were really defining quality data as quantitative plus qualitative data. Uh, and Brett, I think you were going to lead us off on this topic. Right. Thanks, Joseph. I think uh, many of us may remember about six years ago that The Economist published an article um, and it was um, the, the quote is well known now that the world's most uh, valuable resource is no longer oil, um, it's data. And um, well, that might seem somewhat uh, ominous uh, to uh, most of us, it's it's very true, but what do we do with that to really make the data useful? And I think that that's what's uh, really guiding us is what is useful around data. So uh, collecting it because we know data is a powerful problem solver uh, for us, uh, but uh, we're trying to fit a, figure out what is the right balance so that it can be, you can kind of prioritize what's critical in the information that you're getting from that quantitative side to balance it with the qualitative. So there were three sort of key um, uh, topics that came out of that, that there was many, there was a really in-depth discussion around this because I think everyone struggles to understand how it's usage and where it's headed and that it's not uh, replacing perhaps designers because we're not uh, being able to do the quantitative uh, information. We can get that in other meaner, uh, manners, but, uh, I think the three main uh, takeaways were three things, expectations, limitations, and sharing. So with expectations, it had more to do with um, uh, uh, the designers were really talking about realistic expectations. Once you have data, it pushes this sense of perception of speed. Since you have this information, now that you can move quicker to get to an end solution. Is that really right or is that wrong? Um, I think there's a nervousness around that that speed is going to eliminate or cause error or we're not going to do things properly. So how do we change that a little bit and, and leverage that to our advantage is where I think we should be thinking about what that expectation around data so that when we're working with clients, we have a conversation about the information we're gathering and what that means to the end result of a project. The second was um, was uh, limitations, and that's pretty much what you've been uh, mentioned earlier, Joseph, and sort of summarizing this. We uh, we often know, you know, the the quantitative is easier, but the concerns around integration of qualitative um, uh, information is um, oftentimes a shortcoming. How do we blend those two uh, together? Um, that qualitative uh, information 
is is often still done in traditional ways, you know, whether they're focus group sessions or they're just dialoguing with people, whatever it might be, uh, versus sensors and um, and other technology that provides us the quantitative information. So blending those two together is is extremely important, but knowing the limitations of what both provide. And again, having honest conversations about how that data is going to be used to create your project. And then lastly, the sharing thing was really interesting because what we were talking about when we talked about sharing was about post occupancy. Uh, actually, is how the conversation started. Um, and many of us said, well, what do you do with that post occupancy information after it's done? Do you do anything with it? Is it a checkbox that the client asks for? And, and after that, we just kind of hopefully will do something maybe with it. But um, so a stronger messaging around what happens um, in that uh, final moment of completing something and sharing back so that the sharing can be used for the betterment of advancement, corrective measures, maybe new innovations, because we, we know what's going on. So I think, I think the sharing piece was really important to understand how as um, designers, do we share that more? Is it through conversations like we're even having today? Is there a new tool, a new mechanism to share that? Obviously, we all have confidentialities and relationships that you kind of want to maintain, but how do we share that information so it's not, so it's, it's broader, it's much broader and we can utilize that. So that was a, a really interesting uh, conversation around that. And that, you know, the sharing piece, it's sort of a, a, a big ask. Um, how do we how do we do that? But I open that up to also uh, Melissa and Deanna, yourself, Joseph, and anybody in our audience to talk a little bit more about how do we do that so that that can inform all of us and make it uh, take a little bit of the anxiety maybe away of away from us on what we do with this data once we've gathered it at the end and how we can use that for the betterment of future projects. You know, um, Brett, I, I kind of like when I dream a little bit about something that would be so awesome is that that we're scientists, that we're going to go back and uncover what's really working, what's really not. Unfortunately, as designers, we're usually, you know, on to the next project where we're trying to solve a different client problem. And so we really need to team with our industry partners, you know, the dealership, the manufacturers, um, and the occupant, the, the client. I think if you start the project by saying, um, we want to learn from your project. And so, you know, uh, six months after you've occupied it, we're going to go back in and, and take a look at how you're using the space and what's working and what's not. Um, obviously, there it opens you up to all kinds of like continuing services and things like that, and you know, an expectation that you're going to do that for free. So I think that we have to be very creative about, um, you know, are there different types of programs that we can embed as part of our everyday doing business, where post occupancy information is gathered in a way that's universal. Um, and that can be shared. Um, so uh, I, think I'm, done, I'm, mm -hmm. I think we've done a better job. It's it's true. I will that, and and that's a perfect way of saying it's like this is the you know the dream of how we could find it, share it. I'd say you know kind of post pandemic, uh, if there is if we're still post pandemic, um, that we shared more in the last two or three years than we probably have shared in a very long time because we had to, it was an enablement in order for us to understand what others were doing so we could help each other, keeping that sort of, um, that spirit uh, afloat in some way, um, in some you know organized manner versus going back to um, not sharing as much. Um, so I, th I think I saw a lot more, I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but I saw more sharing happening in the last two or three years than I ever have at conferences, virtual uh, seminars, and, and then than then most times in the past. So that's been great. That's been a plus side. And then how do you use that data then to translate that into maybe even good qualitative information that can marry with the quantitative for your clients? That's what's really sort of the, the golden uh, triangle there. Yeah. You know, one thing about data too is, you know, I'm glad you mentioned like timeframes and being able to share is just as data can be helpful, it can also unfortunately be harmful. 
you know, when people want to ask about benchmarks and about what other clients were doing, it's not necessarily for them. So what's right for that one isn't always right for you. And yes, you can fill them with all the information, but it doesn't mean it's, you know, it should be used in a way to inform your process. And then also time frame of data. You know, if, you know, everybody benchmarks all their uh, projects and, you know, we have this bank of the past 15 years. Well, great. Most of that is outdated and excuse what, what's going on recently. So, you know, understanding that. And then also sometimes when you present just a snippet of data without the right explanation, people can interpret it in different ways. I was at a conference once and somebody mentioned like 58% of the people are, are still working from home. Well, that's great. But there's a whole percentage of people who don't have the ability to work from home. Like if I'm a contractor, I can't build something from my house. I'm a doctor. I can't work from home. So without understanding how much of the workforce isn't able to work from home, that data can be interpreted so many different ways. So that's why, like, as a wonderful tool as it is, without the right explanation and without the right context, it can be hurtful. For sure. I mean, it, it's, um, you know, I used to kind of uh, in certain um, circles or conversations introduce myself as a bit of a, a digital pessimist, but I didn't really like the idea of like introducing myself as a pessimist or thinking of myself in that way. So I've started to frame things more as being like an analog optimist, but um, digital and data is here as part of our world. It's not going anywhere. And I think as designers, it's our job to help make meaning of that data. Um, and it's, I mean, personal opinion here, and this may be some of that pessimism coming through, but like data science is a dark art, you know, it's like you can make the numbers say anything you want them to say <laughs> if you're presenting to an audience that's not going to come back and ask those questions of like what you just mentioned, Melissa, around, well, wait a minute, what is this telling us? What is this reporting? What are we hoping to achieve? So I think it's important to use it as a tool and not be used by it as a tool for someone else's purposes. And, you know, I think when you look at the design practice at large, this is such a hugely important topic for us because the value of design services has continually been squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. And so I think the more adept we are at incorporating data into our practice, specifically data that shows better outcomes, the more found, the more of a solid footing we have to advocate for what it takes to produce high quality design. And, you know, we talked a lot about that in the leader to leader event itself. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the other topics that I wanna dive into um, around just shifts in design practice. And I think things that can lead to a more exploratory and playful dynamic in, in design practice is looking at this notion of pilot projects. Um, and Deanna, we were going to ask you to, to make some opening remarks on that one for us. Sure. Yeah. And, and you uh, reiterated this, uh, that we all said, this is not about a mock-up. It's not about, you know, putting in furniture mock-ups. This is about um, really looking uh, to re to as ways of reimagining how we design space and the components that go into the design space and to be partnering um, with manufacturing, uh, which is, you know, Miller Knoll and other companies to really be par partnering around speed to market, understanding what can be uh, put together in a pilot project as a, a testing ground to, to look for different opportunities and to ask and explore. <laughs> And, and you really need to have the entire stakeholder group there. Uh, it has to be, you know, the client has to be willing to, to do this, as well as the design team, the manufacturing team, the dealership team, the, um, the engineering team, you know, because uh, the contracting team, because it, it's about creating spaces sometimes uh, looking at speed to market, uh, agility of the spaces that we're designing, um, uh, um, engagement of the staff uh, in testing uh, the piloted project. Um, you know, how large will the pilot project be? Uh, how long will the pilot project be analyzed? All of these things have to be outlined in the beginning of a project. 
And there needs to be some sort of cost benefit to the client, meaning or value that we're able to describe. It's like, okay, uh, if you part you know, use participatory design and we use our data together to do these pilot projects, um, we're going to have a much more collaborative process that happens. So um, the time for pilots is right now. Uh, clients want to know, you know, every, every round table that I've been to over the last two years, whether it be virtually or in person, I've had uh, the manufacturing group asking what's next from designers. I've had manufacturing asking, well, how do we get access now to people where they're actually working? And designers are trying to get access to clients to understand where is work actually happening, if we're just talking about work. Um, so this open-mindedness that we have right now post-pandemic, it's a time for us to be really pushing the envelope uh, and keeping this beta mindset around how we design space. And obviously there's all kinds of constraints that we have to deal with. One is cost of this and speed, right? So there's a typically a trade-off. So is it possible to pilot certain types of product or uh, types of workplace settings, let's say in a hotel uh, and see how it's being used? and have it become not only that, but you know, creating a win-win scenario for everybody that's involved. Um, you know, other, other tools, you know, reusing existing furniture that was brought up by our team, this is not about reusing existing furniture to try new spaces um, because the experience ends up not being really great. Um, usually reuse of furniture you know, are, is hardware components. Yeah, it's very analog, but there's so much more that's happening with technology and data and space and furnishings and materiality that I think that it's a combination of this analog experience as well as a digital experience that we have to explore. How do people actually use space? And then documenting those insights. Again, I think it's the full cycle of the designer is actually growing. It's, you know, asking the right questions early on to look for quality data and then evaluating design and understanding the successes and the failures of the design. Um, so expanding our role. For sure. Um, there are, I want to make a couple quick statements and then I'm going to go to you, uh, Melissa and Brett. Um, one on the notion of speed. Um, so I was recently participating in a, a series of um, kind of future visioning workshops and kind of towards the tail end of this engagement, someone in the audience kind of jumped up and asked a question and said, you know what, I'm not hearing enough radical propositions here. And um, one of the things that was actually discussed in the course of that, that visioning session was the need to slow down. That was one of the things that was presented. And one of the other panelists jumped in immediately and said, you know what, I would actually challenge your thinking here and say that in this moment in time to slow down is a radical proposition. And it is something that's very different from what is expected and I think what is forced, but it all many times throughout our discussion today, we've mentioned things that require more intention in what we're doing, more planning, more thoughtful approaches, and something that is a bit slower. And I think it's okay to go in and say, you know what, we're going to try this. It's going to be a little bit slower, but we have a high probability of achieving better results. And this is our plan to measure and see whether or not we hit the mark. And so just trying to, to create space for a different type of conversation. The, the other statement that I want to make is, is a, a counterpoint to your idea that this isn't about reusing furniture. I would say it, it depends. I, I think that in some cases there is a really compelling case to reuse some pieces, especially if you're just trying something and you're like, this is a wild idea. I have no idea if this is even gonna manifest, but based on the inventory that we presently have, 
we could reconfigure it to create a completely different social experience in the environment. Um, and I think, you know, speaking to the collaboration across different design partners, that's where the dealers, I think, are a tremendously untapped resource in terms of being able to have probably the best knowledge of anyone of an organization's inventory of what they actually own and being able to pull some of that forward. And I mean, and that's like for the pilot, you know, and once you start to make a, a case for something new, then you've got a solid foundation for a big new investment. But, and I think even just those small um, experiments start to really strengthen bonds of trust um, across all the players in the design project. Um, so, sorry, I ended up going a little bit more on those than I thought <laughs> I was going to, but um, Brett, Melissa, any additional thoughts on um, participatory, uh, excuse me, pilot projects? Sure. I, I, um, I, go, go ahead, ahead Melissa. Melissa. Thanks. Go ahead, Melissa. Go ahead. So I've uh, I've actually only been lucky enough or fortunate enough, I guess, to have two pilots in my career. Uh, so, you know, but there was definite benefit to it, but it does go into the time factor. So one client was coming from a 40 year old uh, workplace mm -hmm. trying to change their mind shift about like what a new workplace could, could look like. The pilot was invaluable for that. And they were lucky that they happened to have like 20,000 square feet of additional space that we got to fit out as new work styles, new collaborative styles and everything. And they actually used it for about six months. Um, it was actually the very first time I've also gotten to work in a space that I was a part of designing. And I found my own issues with it right off the bat, which was able to fix for the next one. So that was a huge benefit. And it ended up actually informing the larger scale uh, projects. And obviously we had the time because it was close to a 400,000 square foot project. And what we were even able to do was potentially not build out and fit out everything. They were able to shell some areas and use it for future growth or change it actually to larger amenities than they had thought that they needed. So that was a huge benefit of that type of project. Another one is actually going to be built now, and they're doing it in a different way. Again, it's another 400,000 square foot project. They're just going to build out one floor. And what we're piloting is very different neighborhoods that you know, came out of all these focus groups and visioning sessions about how the different departments each work. Um, mm -hmm. And Bill, the, the, this, this uh, client is also uh, R&D and corporate function. So it's also two different types of businesses coming together in one headquarters. So everything's designed very differently. And they're going to actually build out one floor and then wait a year. We're going to analyze, possibly iterate what's on that floor, and then eventually build out up. So it's just an interesting way of, and then also they're using it as a tool to help to hopefully transition everybody back. So it's just interesting, but it's, you know, time is something that is needed for some of these extra steps. But to the, whoever made the comment, uh, Joseph, to you about, you know, maybe faster is so, so better too. I think it depends on the client and the level of participation you get from them. Because sometimes you can iterate real fast if everybody's engaged. And actually come yeah. up with something, you know, quick and, you know, that you can pilot really, really fast. And then you maybe you get it right and you just roll right into it. Or maybe you can reiterate fast. So I think that there is a benefit um, of that. And to your point, utilizing manufacturers and dealers in order to help bring in different styles for people to test and run through that things that they've never even thought of or heard of before in terms of furniture design and different configurations is a benefit. And, you know, it doesn't even matter. Like sometimes it's like, it doesn't matter the color. It doesn't matter this, just bring us all these components and you get them together and then people start to play with them. And then you learn really, really fast about what's successful and what's not and what meets uh, those work styles and that client. I, I'm going to, I'll tag, I'll tag onto that. Actually, I'm going to take us just back to the sort of the front end of pilot projects and just say that one thing that's super important, and, and Deanna touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to reiterate, is um, clarity of outcome. Because we still are thinking that a lot of the pilots, even coming out of the pandemic, are about how many people we can get back to work and get people happy again and, and all of that. But maybe the questions we're asking about out, uh, outcomes of pilots need to shift and be a little bit different than that. Um, supportive, like, um, why are they how are the how is this pilot going to support our culture um, or how is this pilot going to support the career growth of our employees those are interesting uh, dialogues because everyone's facing those kinds of ideas uh, around how 
they can not only engage their employees, but how can their culture be um, strengthened and, and strong versus how can we kind of pack it in and make it more, something more functional. So taking more of the functional aspect of a pilot away and more aspirational around the pilot. So I think it, it being clear on the outcome and maybe asking um, different questions uh, may be um, something that engages our clients at a different level than what has typically been seen before uh, around pilots and those sort of traditional outcomes that we've seen. Because if there's anything to be said about what we lived through in the last three years is nothing's been traditional. And, and we're right, the time is now and the appetite is now. So this might be the right time to ask questions that are a little bit far, more far reaching than, than typically in the past pilots that we've done. I love that. Joseph, I think that's so true. And the panel, we've got about five minutes for the last uh, segment here, um, and we've got some really great questions from the audience in chat. So I want to leave time at the end for those. Got it. Um, and that's a great moment to just pause. We've covered a tremendous amount of ground. It's been very difficult to skip over these topics so lightly. There are 20 other things in mind that I wanted to dive into. So I'm hoping that some of that is coming up in the questions. But for now, we're going to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to reference um, one of my design favorites, George Nelson. There's a quote that many of us are familiar with um, that he made saying, design is a response to social change. Well, there's more to that quote than we more often we hear most often. And so that is design is a response to social change. No design can exist in isolation. It is always related, sometimes in very complex ways to an entire constellation of influencing situations and attitudes. What we call a good design is one which achieves integrity, that is unity or wholeness in balanced relation to its environment. Um, so the thing that I love about many of the, the topics that we've discussed today, it's about shifting away from rote industry benchmarks and standards and starting to build a context in which you can be self-referential in your design and self-benchmarking. And all of that, I think, is part of a broader societal shift that we're seeing and a broader shift in design culture. So when you think of um, design as a response to social change, what sort of culture shifts are coming to mind for you, either in your own practice area or that you would like to see in the industry at large? And I'll just open that up to um, all three of you for a quick statement. Deanna, jump in first. Yeah, so I would just say diversity of voices is that, and, and diversity of voices um, to get another point of view, uh, because everyone's personal experience or uh, experience of the world uh, is going to give different markers and milestones of what needs to be achieved. And I think that we are much more inclusive today uh, than we have been um, because there's so much radical change uh, that we've had to confront disruption, not only, you know, global disruption of COVID, but economic disruption and technology disruption. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Harvard Business Review just came out with a, a new article around, uh, you know, how to harness the skill set around IA, you know, uh, or AI. I do that every time. <laughs> Artificial <laughs> intelligence. I, 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 I um, you know, there is a voice also for how to integrate humanely technology. So, um, you know, we are seeing uh, more than ever the influences on design in all industries and back to design. Um, so uh, keeping, keeping, you know, integrators and instigators involved in our design process is going to be key for us to be doing things that are forward link forward looking and actually responding to the human condition wonderful um melissa quick thought on culture change so uh, yeah i mean there's a lot that's changed in the past few years um for sure i think one of the benefits that you know we can learn from different groups different cultures and um is just different ways like coming out of the pandemic i think everybody you know first was scared and then obviously started to enjoy life. And I think that's a great thing. It's actually what I learned from some of the different generations in the office. Um, you know, we come together and collaborate and in, encourage everybody's voices to be shared and be heard. But also what you can learn from them is to detach. Uh, that's like new for some people. 
you know, work ethic goes into that and just enjoy your life outside and away from this. Like this technology advances and some of that honestly scares me. Like, oh, we have a client that's moving onto a new space and the client that they're going to share a floor with is a clothing app that clothes that clothes your virtual self. I don't even know what that means. But what about my physical self? <laughs> because I'm a real person. I don't want to just live in some virtual world. And, you know, I get scared that that might be something that could come eventually. Like I was in a hotel lobby and there was a woman who was on a conference call with one of the Oculuses on. What? But like, who knows where in the world she was doing that? But why wouldn't you take that off and be present at the same time? So I don't know. I'm more about that. And that's what I try to encourage in the office and making sure that, you know, the different generations all come back for that collaborative, that culture, that team building. That's what's important. And that was what I missed during the pandemic the most, like holding up sketches like this. Guys, see what I'm talking about? That was the worst thing in the world. And I never want to go back to that. And the thought of living this way is even scarier to me. But that's because I'm old. <laughs> Speak that with you, Brett, but Joseph is muted. <laughs> oh, muted. Okay, I'll Brain, go. I'll like go because he's, he's muted. He was laughing or coughing or something. Um, and Melissa, I challenge you to go into maybe the the virtual world. I'm saying it to you out loud so I can challenge myself, but I'll challenge you go to the virtual world and and think that that might actually help inform your personal world. So anyway, I'll leave you with that one. But <laughs> we could talk about that one for a while. Um, I, I'd say my whole response to the social change. I love that quote. Uh, quote from George Nelson, but um, I'd say, in this is a, a strange way to say it, but inclusive inclusivity. And what I really mean by that is, you know, we've been living in a world where we where thinking about social change around um, diversity, equity, inclusion has been so prominent in our minds over the last few years. But I always look at those three and I kind of pick them apart and I just and I, and I, I fall to the word inclusive when it comes to social change because it includes all of those things. Diversity of people, geographies, culture, equitable responses to anything that's happening, technology changes, environmental concerns, climate, and all of those things that we look at that make up those transformational things that end up turning out to be what we call social change. Um, so um, I, I think about it saying, you know, challenging uh, maybe myself, teammates, peers, everyone here, that um, when you take a look at something, think about it from that perspective of being inclusive around everything that you're doing. Are, are you really making sure you're touching um, everything and the outcome will be a little bit uh, a little bit different because you gave it more th forethought um, and and that'll make some social change. For sure. And, you know, I've got to jump in and acknowledge here. Um, there's a tremendous amount of work to do. You know, even when I reflect back on the leader to leader event, um, someone came up afterwards and said, you know what? Ninety percent of all of your percenters, maybe more, were men. She was not wrong. Um, I look at the the. The presentation across this panel, a lot of light skin faces. Um, for me, when it comes to entering into design conversations, what I've started to try to implant in the front of my mind is that there are perspectives that are missing. And that means that we are going to have a design outcome of lower quality because it is not actually incorporating the necessary perspectives. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on that point. And I think that the more that we collectively kind of push back and challenge when we see that people aren't at the table and voices aren't included, um, how do we bring those forward? Alan, we didn't leave you 10 minutes. Um, we've got about six. Yes, well, um, why don't we start uh, with the first one here? It's a question that I think the panel already addressed. And uh, the comment or question was, could the research and analysis of post-occupancy data become a new branch, a new field where interior designers could align themselves with a new related profession? And it, it's funny, uh, Deanna, I wrote down something you said, the full cycle of a designer is growing, expanding the role of the designer. So I would say that, uh, I'm just uh, you know commenting there that I think that this this panel would uh, would tend to agree with that question. Here here's another question from Amanda in uh, DC. Are you finding that clients are asking for participatory design or immediately open to it, or are you having to educate and convince them it's a good model? So uh, I. 
I'll, I'll take that one since I spoke about it first and then you chime in. I'm finding that clients are open to it. And honestly, we bring it up as part of our first initial meeting with them about the process and how it should be laid out and how their involvement should be. Um, and I think they're very responsive to it. And most of them actually appreciate the fact that you want to hear their perspective. You want to gain their insight and that you're generally interested in designing something specifically for them instead of what your idea for them is. You know, uh, that our really good clients all do that. They're very open, open and intentional with us, particularly when we talk about the process and how rich the process becomes. The C-suite particularly gets drawn to that. What we still run across, and we all have to be aware of it, is some very transactional clients that they just want a transactional experience. And what we can share with them is, well, you're going to get something that will be out of date, literally, by the time you move in. And you're going to spend all of this money to do all these things. <laughs> And you're not going to get the outcomes that you really want. And it, you have to be very bold about that. And sometimes it might mean that you lose a client. But, as but a, with that, as with a that Diana, client, yeah, those, mm -hmm. that's great. To, it's great to do it. But, you know, it's like, show me the money. You have to show them the example because oftentimes they're just they hear what you're saying, but they they want an example of how that succeeded somewhere else. So I agree with you in trying to uh, to to educate them around it and convince them that it's a good model to do that, not be outdated. But oftentimes they're um, they're nervous. They have concerns over doing it. It feels like they might be put out on a limb. So um, I think showing some concrete examples of how that was successful somewhere else is important. Great, great. So here's a question from uh, Jennifer, and this is on the topic of pilot projects. She comments that uh, it, uh, in her experience, she's found that uh, larger, more established clients or clients who are focused on R&D uh, tend to embrace the pilots more. Uh, but then she also states getting clients and designers to ask what questions the pilot is going to ask before is critical. Discovery is awesome, but we need to know uh, uh, what we are asking the pilot to examine. Uh, so the uh, question for the panel is, what questions do you think are best answered in a pilot? Well, I would I would I would go back to I think I gave a couple. Uh, change change the change the shift of what the questions that we're asking. Stop asking that you know you want to return people to work or you want to do whatever it is. Think about it more aspirationally because that sh that shifts it. So ask the question of how it's going to inform or advance their culture. Or um, I gave the example of a career path for um, somebody. Or pick something else that that finds you in a more um, aspirational mode, so that in the end it actually does help. It might change some of the, the organization's approach to things. I think that th those are the interesting questions to ask than the perfunctory tactical things of a pilot and did it work for us to get everybody down to you know 35 square feet per person and those those things happen. Uh, but I think we need to go beyond that. So I would be asking and some very wider, broader, broader questions. Get your hands on your client's corporate strategy. What are their That's strategic right. objectives? Mm -hmm. Use your design mind to think about how place can be a tool to help them achieve their strategic objectives. And if you can figure that out, you'll get a call back again um, the next time. That's absolutely right, Joseph. That's uh, been been my experience uh, with clients is um, uh, understanding their business model. And, you know, one of the first things that we ask uh, is, you know, what's keeping you up at night? And it might be employee retention, or it might be the next generation, or it might be that they, you know, 30% of their, their workforce is going to be retiring in the next five years, or ups, upskilling technology. Whatever, whatever the problem is, design can actually help solve it. And that's our job to try to figure out what the, what the issues are that they're trying to solve in their business because space can do so much more. It can perform on so many other levels um, around culture, around 
uh, attracting and retaining around yeah. health and wellness experience. Yeah. Um, you know. So, you know, we, we are um, at time, but we're going to do one more question, speed round form, right? So uh, one or two sentence answer. So, uh, so the question is from uh, Taylor. Uh, and this is on uh, participatory design. I think this is a, often a challenge for, for everyone. Are there guardrails around participatory design approach to help avoid design by committee pitfalls? So um, uh, what is everyone's uh, one or two sentence uh, reaction to uh, design by committee and participatory design? Who would like to start? I can start. No, Go ahead. I would say um, a strong voice from the design team as the leader and a strong voice from the client team as well that have to be united because people have to know how to say no. I think that's the biggest thing. And people are always afraid to use that one word. Um, but it's 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 no in a way of trying to understand the essence of what they're trying to gain, but also you're the expert. But, yeah, so that's they, great, Melissa. That's great. That's great. Who's next? I was going to say the same thing. So, Melissa, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Time I, I, would say, I would say have three guiding principles. If somebody throws out an idea, doesn't fit into one of the buckets, it's out. Yep, that's great. That's great. All right. Joseph, do you want to comment on this one? Um, I, maybe building on Brett's point, it's just really important to frame the ask. You're not, it's not asking about all personal whims and desires here, mm -hmm. but it's about what is needed to be successful relative to X. And the more clearly you frame that up front, the better the input you're going to get. Um, but that's your job. You have to kind of put that frame around the ask and help mm -hmm. the client do that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, th this has been a uh, an amazing conversation. It is a real challenge to bottle uh, three days of that leader to leader event into uh, you know an hour long panel conversation. But uh, I think this group has done uh, an excellent job. In addition to this uh, conversation that we are recording, there will be a written uh, report that is coming out that will have uh, more detail on everything that we have discussed. And uh, finally, I would like to thank this uh, amazing panel. Uh, Joseph, uh, excellent job as always as a facilitator. And then uh, our three very thoughtful guests from all corners of North America, Melissa, Deanna, and Brett. Um, your uh, contribution has been amazing and we truly enjoy uh, working with you. So thank you all very much. And to the audience, uh, Thank you all for tuning in to Miller Knoll Design Perspectives. Thanks so much, everybody. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.